Welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast, where we aim to ignite the fire that allows you to unleash your greatest potential. I'm your host, Dan McPherson, and I'm on a mission to help you own your story on the way to building your ideal life. The first step toward achieving your dreams is to overcome the momentum of zero. Take a step and let that motion dispel the emotions of fear, worry, or self-doubt. No matter where you are in your life or career, only you can make that choice. The good news, you've got this. Why? Because dreams are real. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast. I'm your host, Dan McPherson. I'm here with another exciting guest who I have known for a short time, but have been inspired by for years now. Little may he know that, but I've been stalking him for years around the interwebs and his story, his passion, his direction, his business, his life is something that you absolutely need to hear about. With that, I will introduce you to our guest, Nick Sweeno, martial artist extraordinaire, business owner, and entrepreneur extraordinaire. Thanks for being here, Nick. I'm so glad to be here, Dan. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I am looking forward to it as well. I know a good amount about what you're doing now, and I look forward to learning a little bit about the background, filling in the gaps, and sharing your excitement with everyone around the world. Yeah, this is going to be great, man. All right. So when we start, I, I, I always am thinking about the, the, the current and the future, but I like to pause for a moment and go back. What is the, the origin story of Nick? Where, where do you come from? What, what formed the magic that is now you? Uh, well, let's see. Um, I was born in 1960, right here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I was the child of academics. Uh, father was professor of Russian language and literature at the University of Michigan. And my mother was a fine arts uh, academic and eventually went on to do fine arts as a career. Um, so I was steeped in a lot of culture growing up, uh, very comfortable with people from around the world and with arts and culture. Interestingly, and we'll probably get to this later, I was also raised in, a, in an anti-capitalist environment. My parents were very much academics and not necessarily business people. Um, I'm not sure that they appreciated or understood what it meant to make uh, a good living. And it took me a long time to unlearn some of the things I learned in my childhood. How did that influence you as you were growing up? That's a, that's a different environment than it seems like many are growing up in in this part of the world now. Yeah. So um, our take, our family take on, on money was that only shallow people had money or pursued it. And if they did have money, they must be uh, some, in some way uh, uh, broken people, incapable of intellectual thought. It was a terrible environment. There were a lot of st- a lot of stereotypes uh, that that my folks had that that it took me a long time to unlearn. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm not sure where it came from, but I know they were both you know deeply involved in the academic environment. Both university people spent a lot of time. Uh, in, in, they were both very well educated, uh, but just somehow, my formative years were all about uh, uh, all about learning. In an academic setting, the expectation was college, advanced degree, and then an academic career, uh, you know, probably not a lot of financial success, and, um, you know, write books, which I did, um, but uh, don't make money, which I, uh, th- that advice I did not heed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you didn't. What is it that maybe inspired you to break outside of that paradigm? It can be tough, especially if both parents are in that and they're, it sounds like they held very strong opinions. How did you move outside of that? You know, interestingly, um, the martial arts helped me stay in that mindset longer than I should have and break out of it. So there's this whole, there's this whole self-denial side of the martial arts, especially the Japanese martial arts historically, right? A samurai was a guy who could, you know, when he was hungry, right, he would breathe air. You know, if he had no food, he would pick his teeth. <laughs> um, you know, you would give up everything in pursuit of the art. And I had about a 10 year period of my life where I was focused so strongly on learning the martial arts that I kind of subscribed to that mentality. Okay. I won't make any money, you know, I'll have the least job possible, I'll train all the time, you know, I'll do whatever it takes, um, 
it was all about self-denial and that kind of perpetuated my idea that I could live with next to no money, that I shouldn't pursue money, that instead I should pursue these kind of deep inside things. Uh, and as I said, that was about a 10 year period, but martial arts also helped me make the switch. After I trained in Japan for four years and had a lot of success there, I came back to the US, looked around for an opportunity to train and couldn't find any place that I thought was good enough to bother with. So I opened my first martial arts school and that was hugely eye-opening. And I suddenly realized I had to make rent every month. I had to pay the <laughs> utility bills. I had you know, insurance to pay. Reality um, comes crashing in. Yeah. So it was another 10-year period of learning, holy cow, I've got, to, I've got to pay the bills. And at the end of that 10 years, it was no longer something I had to do, but something I enjoyed. I learned to do it, you know, make a game out of it, have fun, and get really good at it. Um, and I re- reproduced that in a number of different settings since then. So before you went through the, uh, the, the 20 years of various types of wilderness, <laughs> when, you were, when you were younger, did you have dreams? I did have dreams. I remember from a very early age wanting to be a writer. Um, I would write these cute little books in uh, third and fourth grade. Um, I don't know if I still have any of them, but I would love to pull them out and laugh at myself. Publish those. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and that always seemed like a good idea. Again, it was the idea that you'd be a writer. It never really occurred to me that there was a way to do that, you know, and make a living. Um, but I always wanted to be a writer. And then from age eight, I wanted to be a martial artist. That was one of those serendipitous things. I stepped into a, um, judo dojo at age eight and was starstruck and I've never stopped being starstruck. There's, you know, some things you, you have to struggle to stay excited about. Um, for whatever reason, Japanese martial arts, I, I fell in love with the first day I set foot in a dojo. And now 51 years later, I'm just as much in love with it as I was at that time. Sounds like it was part of the fiber of your soul and you found the resonant cord and jumped right in. It seems like I did. Yeah. So judo was the first martial art that you learned then? Yeah, it was. I, I started it, as I said, in 1968, eight years old, um, had some great experiences. That was at the old, uh, what, they, what do they call it that in those days? Uh, the YMCA, then they call it the Ann Arbor Y, I think they call it now. Uh, but there's been a judo club there forever. And I studied with some great folks, um, had a lot of success in competition as a kid, kind of unconsciously. It wasn't something I pursued, but um, it, what, we, what was really interesting, and I've taken this lesson to a lot of different places, um, there were guys that were in my club that could beat me inside the club every single day they were they were they would trounce me in the club but in tournaments i would beat them and people better than them because for whatever reason my first few years in that environment it didn't freak me out and it did freak them out <laughs> and I, can't, I can't explain why it was just one of the it's just like when i get on stage now um uh some things there's some things that terrify me so i'm not i'm not necessarily tooting my own horn you know uh some people like chocolate cake some people like apple pie I'm one of those guys that likes being in front of an audience and I'm very comfortable there. And that started er early on. I could get in front of a, an audience in a judo tournament and I'd just be as relaxed as I was inside a, you know, inside the home dojo. So everything felt slow to you where they stressed and tensed and it felt fast to them. And I suspect you're right. Right. That's I've, I struggle personally in some of those physical pieces where I'm performing for example, martial arts in front of everybody. I I tend to tense and speed up, but I resonate with what you're saying about being on stage and speaking. Where I I could I could do that all day. I, I that's 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 every bit of energy flowing through my being. So I, I get that. Your dream was a writer. Then you entered. Then you encountered martial arts. Did that quickly shift over to being this is what I need to do with my life? Was it was it like a, a switch flipping? Was it gradual or was that not really the dream that it switched? That was just part of it. Yeah, um, I don't think it was ever conscious. I just did martial arts because I liked it and I just kept doing it. My dream or my vision for the future was still go to college, go to grad school, probably teach. Um, and that, that stayed with me for a long time. You know, I, I went to University of Michigan. I spent five and a half years there. I got a, a degree in English Lit and everything but a degree in psychology. Um, you can, you can leave school with those two degrees and make zero dollars. <laughs> Been um, there. <laughs> and then, uh, somebody talked, talked me into signing up for the master's degree program in creative writing, which is sort of an English lit degree with a, with a bunch of writing tacked on. Um, I got that degree, uh, another degree you can have and, and, and be broke. 
<laughs> and then, um, and then it had always been my dream to go study martial arts in the homeland. So when I finished grad school, I moved to Tokyo um, and got a great job where I could work 20 hours a week and make as much money as folks were making back here, working full time and still train in martial arts, you know, two, three times a day and did that for four years. And that was, that was paradise. I think, I think it's worth mentioning there. You just said two or three times a day. Most people, even who train martial arts, getting them to do two or three times a week is a little tough. And you're like, I'm doing it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Well, you know, I had the opportunity, I had some letters of introduction to some of the best living martial artists post-World War II that Japan has ever had. So the doors that opened for me, I was awestruck. So it wasn't one of those cases where you just go, yeah, I'm going to go see how this guy is, right? I walk in the door and go, holy crap, this is my moment. Like, I've been working for this, you know, for 20 years. Um, I better make the best of it. And, um, you know, I had some great relationships with teacher. The most, the most extraordinary martial artist I've ever met was my uh, Iaido teacher. Iaido is a form of swordsmanship you may know about. Um, uh, this guy, Yamaguchi Katsuo Sensei. Um, just uh uh you know he five foot five foot four hundred and twenty pounds when he demonstrated he could demonstrate in front of a stadium and the place would become absolutely silent this guy had a radiant energy that i've never experienced before or since um and yet was one of the kindest most generous people i've ever met so he really you know he was he was the pivotal human being for me you know my first 28 years and then my subsequent years um, being able to train with him and people like him just meant that, you know, if he said, hey, I'm going to be at the dojo from 3 to 6 p.m. on Thursday, I would turn over the, you know, I would flip cars over to get there. I would be there. And I had other people like that. So it was just, uh, uh, you know, when someone says, here's the keys to the kingdom, you do whatever it takes to get there. That's that's right? an incredible opportunity. What uh, Obviously, you would have learned a lot of martial arts from him. What is a, a lesson? You said he was a pivotal, pers pivotal person in your life. What is something that, that you changed or an understanding that you came to as a result of your relationship with him? Here's an incredible lesson um, that, that I struggled with forever. You have, to be, you have to learn how to be the best follower on the planet if you want to be one of the best leaders on the planet. And I, you know, you're, you're, you, you, you learn the most important lessons in life through inspiration or desperation. This was a case of inspiration. As I said, I'd step into this guy's dojo awestruck. If he had said, go play in traffic, I, I would have done it. I mean, I just, I emptied my cup. Like they said, I would have jumped off a bridge if the guy said I should jump off a bridge. And so that was a case of inspiration. And I followed him. You know, I would have followed him to the ends of the earth. And doing that for four years gave me some insights into what level of commitment you have to have, right? On a physical level, on a mental level, on a spiritual level. And now I know, right? It's not intellectual knowledge, <laughs> right? Now I know what it means to be a follower, what level of commitment is possible. And so I know uh, uh, how much I can expect from people. And as a guy who was sort of young and anti-authority and radical, you know, before I went to Japan, that was life-changing for me. I can only imagine. That's a that's a very powerful lesson and well said for sure. As you came back and you you start your own company, <laughs> you start your own dojo, you're running a business. Was was it what you thought it would be? Was it different than you thought it would be? Uh, well, you know, I was naive when I started. I thought that owning a dojo would be all about training, and I'd have great people come in, and it'd be easy, and we'd all have fun together and be great martial artists. As it turns out, <laughs> a lot more work involved. You know, running a business is running a business. There's a lot more, right? You got you to gotta meet payroll. You got to pay the rent. You got to pay taxes. You know, you've got to find an accountant. You got to incorporate. Um, and so that was a whole nother, that was a whole nother level of work I didn't expect. And then as in any endeavor, you'll have a few people that are ideal students. And then you'll have some people that are okay. And then you have some people that are tough and you got to work a lot harder with them. So. Um, I just learned there was a lot more work involved in it. And there were times when I struggled with that notion. But over the years, you know, I'm still in the game. Um, I've learned to love it. And I've learned that I can make great positive changes in people's lives by being there for them, by helping them learn the martial arts and a lot of the things that 
you know, the, the, uh, the alternative lessons, the, the life lessons that you get when you spend a lot of time with people. Are there consistent life lessons that you see people getting as they go through training to, are, are there one or two things that jump out that almost everybody learns that might, that might surprise them or might be, or might be just something that they gain by going through that aren't the physical arts themselves? Uh, so many of them, uh, I could talk for a long time, but I'll just give you a few highlights. Uh, one is, uh, something you've heard me say, which is the old Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight. Um, the, the lesson they learn early is that if you fall down, you get up, right? It's not a big deal. Literally. How you learn. Literally. <laughs> um, and then they learn it metaphorically, right? Out in right. life, I tried something, sensei, it didn't work out. What should I do? I'll try it again. Um, and then over the long term, the more advanced lesson that I've shared with you and others is that I think fall down seven, get up eight means you, if you really truly are going to prevail in life, you have to fall down. It's not, it's not an alternative. It's not a choice. You have to do things. And if you're not failing, it probably means you're not trying things that are challenging enough. So that's the lesson I've learned. So that's one, right? Fall down seven, get up eight means get your butt out there, do stuff, fail, get up and do it again. That is a powerful lesson in, in accepting that we need to fall down to win is something that most people, I think, resist. They spend their lives trying to live in safety and avoid any falling. Have you found that to be true as well? Absolutely. And I just, you know, um, I, I've told the story too about um, um, when, when, uh, you know, when my father died uh, many years ago, I didn't really deal with the grief. And I kind of kept it wrapped up sub seven, seven years later when I got divorced, all that grief came, came out and I had to deal with it then. Um, if you bottle up part of your emotions, you don't get to experience the others. What I realized at that time was once I coped with all the challenging emotions, I was also able to be a lot happier. So if you turn off your emotions, right, you're going to turn them all off, the good ones and the bad ones. If you Stay away from failure because you're afraid of it. It's going to deprive you of opportunity on the upside. These less, it's like a Fibonacci sequence in life. The negative and positive both exist. Learn to embrace the negative and let it teach you the lessons it needs to teach you. And you can rise much more quickly. Powerful for sure. As you, you mentioned that you had to cope with a lot of grief that had been bottled up all at once. And it sounds like a very large straw broke a, a camel's back. Any, any thoughts that you would have for our audience if they're dealing with a large amount of grief? We have, we have people who are going through some pretty incredible things that, as, I, as I encounter them. Um, I think this is very personal, so I don't know how it works for others. Um, I've gotten to the point now where if I'm struggling with something that's scary or invokes grief is that I'll just jump in. I'll use whatever I can, mentor, support group, family, and I'll just wade into it. And when I do that, um, it's almost like it dissolves. Uh, you know, we all have inside stuff, right? How you deal with the inside stuff determines how hard the outside stuff's going to be. And um, if, you, if you accept that and move into the inside stuff, it can be really scary, but it turns out the scariest thing about it is anticipating <laughs> stepping in, right? It's, it's scarier to anticipate a bad experience or dealing with grief than it is to actually deal with it. And so, yeah, accept it, right? Tears are fine. You know, struggle is fine. Um, you know, depression and grief are fine. Jump in there, figure them out and move forward. We don't have a lot of time. You never know when your turn is going to come. So I believe you got to jump in. It's just as hard to live a life of mediocrity, right? As it is to live a life of excellence. Uh, but in a life of mediocrity, the pain comes later and it's too late to do anything about it. <laughs> At least if you're striving for excellence, you're dealing with the problems now, right? And, and the better you get at that, the easier it becomes. The, the grief and sadness and, and fear uh, uh, are, are much bigger uh, in, the, in the windshield than they are in the rearview mirror. That sounds like a pretty big lesson to have learned along the way. What would you say is maybe the, the biggest lesson that you've learned and, and maybe in your entrepreneurial journey, certainly uh, they, the, I, I believe in general that people have one life. We like to say I have a work life and I have a, and I have a, a home life. I, I don't personally believe that's true. I believe we have a life and that we, that we should live that 
in in search of excellence. We should live that in search of inspiration and 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 focused upon others. But as you look back, what would you say for our audience? Maybe the biggest lesson you've learned along the way in your journey. The biggest lesson. It's pretty simple. Uh, you can do it. <laughs> you really can, right? Everything that says you can't is just an excuse, right? Maybe your excuse, and maybe the world's excuse. But I think the world really wants you to succeed, and you just have to learn to listen to the right voices. So, you know, Nike says, just do it. There's this business mentor named Dan Pena. He says, just effing do it. Uh, I think the lesson's the same. Just start. Lately, I've been talking. Uh, lately, I've been talking about life as a, especially business as a, like a round of golf. I don't know if your listeners play golf, but the best players in golf hit the ball straight down the center, right? Then they hit it again. Then they hit it on the green. Then they put it in. It goes in the hole, and it's a very simple process. Other golfers will hit it, and it'll veer off to the left, and then they hit it again, and it'll go off to the right side of the course, and then they'll hit it to the green, and then they'll put it, and it'll finally go in. They both hit four or five strokes. They're in the hole. Their journey looks nothing like, right? One person's journey doesn't look like the other one. And life is self-correcting like that. When you look at a journey and you say, I don't know how to get from here to there. The truth is, whether you think you know or you think you don't know, if you're determined to get there, you can get there. You just have to set foot on the path and not leave it. It's going to be circuitous. You're going to hit to the right side of the green and the left side of the green. You just got to do it, right? Just, so just hit start. the ball. Yeah, if you, uh, Zig Ziglar always used to say, I've never known anybody to take the second step who hasn't taken the first step first. So if I've learned one lesson in life is take the first step, like just take it, right? right. And then you're, in, you're underway and now it's too late. Go. I, f- I frequently talk about that is that the most difficult thing we have to do is overcome the momentum of zero. Mm, that's a great way of saying it. That's uh, it. the, it's, and, and originally I, I think I, I stumbled on the idea for that, that thought or the, the that phrasing when I was doing something that uh, was a, was a discipline thing for me. It was the couch to 5k program when I, I am not a runner. I run when people chase me with weapons that happens more often than I would like, but, but that's that I tried to fall in love with running on more than one occasion. And I did this couch to 5k program that literally gets you off the couch to run a 5k. And everything that 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 they talk about in the groups that are that you, that support that endeavor is you are ahead of the person on the couch getting off the couch is the hardest thing you will do and in your case maybe stepping up and hitting that ball or stepping on stage or stepping where you need to that's a that's certainly a powerful lesson you've gone through this this whole this whole journey what when people ask you now what do you do look you're you're an author you're you're an academic of sorts yourself you you're a martial artist you you run you run all of these businesses which we haven't even talked about yet how do you answer the question when people ask you what do you do uh i think the first answer i give of late is that i i'm a serial entrepreneur um i love 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 the challenges of business they're like the challenges of martial arts. They're like the challenges of personal relationships. Uh, but there's this really neat scorecard that I think people uh, who, with my background, right, who are anti, uh, you know, I was raised anti-money, anti-capitalism. Um, the, the, the scorecard of how your business is doing is a very powerful one. You can't let finances rule your life, but they create opportunity right? I, if I make more money in my business, it means I'm doing a better job. It means I can pay my employees more. It means I can uh, upgrade the infrastructure. It means I can donate more to charity. There's this great scorecard. So I like to say I'm a serial entrepreneur because it really reflects everything I do. I find a great idea. I build a business around it. I help that business succeed. Um, and uh, when it does, it's rewarding for me and it's rewarding for everybody that works in the business. And hopefully it's rewarding for the people who we serve. In my experience, you do everything that you do with a heart for people as well, which is incredible. I talk with a lot of potential clients and I, and even when I, even when I speak, one of the conversations that we have it, it, because I work with so many creatives is that many people today think that you can either chase money or you can help people and that these are separate activities. I believe pretty passionately 
that if you focus upon helping people, doing everything you can to help them win, that other things will take care of themselves. But I also believe that if you do that without any strategy, you will end up with no money. If you focus upon helping others and you do so strategically, that money is actually the natural outflow of that endeavor so that and that's what i see from you you focus so much upon other people but you do it with a with a brilliance and a strategy behind it and so of course money would be the natural outflow allowing you to then do more yeah you know i loved it you know i had coffee uh, i can't remember now three weeks or a month ago and we were talking about systems right we were talking about funnels and and online business and building a list and you stopped and you said hey Wait a minute. Let's let's talk about the distinction between making money for money's sake and, right. and dealing with people as humans. And I, I I remember you saying that very clearly, and that was a great moment for me because I I agree with you. Um, uh, we haven't talked about gratitude yet, right? Which is is one of the most powerful success engines in the world. Um, but uh, uh, I I would absolutely not be here and be the person I am today without some incredible people both in terms of mentors, like my sword teacher that I described, and business partners. Uh, I couldn't do what I do without really good people who have helped me build these businesses. Uh, and so, and I've been blessed. I've honestly been blessed. In 2006, when I came back to Ann Arbor, uh, you know, I came back with a few bucks in the bank, no job, no prospects. Um, here I am, 13 years later, I've done really, really well. The world has given me everything I've asked for. Um, and the promise of the future is bright. It's all connected to the people I know, the people I've helped, the people who've helped me. Without them, I have no idea where I'd be. It wouldn't be like this. Relationships are foundational to everything. I love it. Absolutely. As we, as we think about the entrepreneurs in our audience or those who are maybe considering becoming an entrepreneur and they're facing some of these fears, it's good, I think, to talk about risks and defining moments and lessons and all of that. You, you shared a, a big lesson and a lot of insight so far. What would you claim as your defining moment as an entrepreneur? Ooh, that's a fabulous question. Um, <laughs> nobody's ever asked me that before. My defining moment as an entrepreneur, um, I've had two and, and, they're both about success and failure in a moment. Um, one is when I first put together the group of investors to start the Japanese Martial Arts Center. In 2005, I was in Lansing, Michigan, having dinner at P.F. Chang's restaurant with about five friends of mine, all of whom were pretty well established in business. And I had this vision of coming back to Ann Arbor and starting the Japanese Martial Arts Center. And, and I pitched it. Um, but I could have stayed in Traverse City. I had a great life up there. I was practicing law in Traverse City. I lived next to 25,000 acres of national forest land. I was two minutes from East Prairie and Traverse Bay in the most beautiful, you know, Asia blue waters on the planet. Um, I could have stayed there, but I had this vision for the martial arts school. And I pitched this vision of a martial arts school in Ann Arbor. I drew the picture for them in very clear terms. And, and their enthusiasm was unbelievable. I mean, they, you know, the, this is just a metaphor because what, what mattered most to me was their uh, willingness to back the endeavor on an emotional level, but they all opened their checkbooks. That was cool. Um, that made it obvious to me that the world wanted what I had to offer and that there were people there willing to stake, right? That's amazing. Uh, some part of their pocketbook on what I, what I had. And then fast forward about, uh, about eight or nine years later, we had to move JMAC from one building to another. And uh, moving is expensive. You have infrastructure costs, right? We have this expensive sprung floor. You, you know, you got to paint. You got you to move the stuff. Uh, moving at that time was about a $50,000 endeavor. We just had to come up with that much money. I had not taken a paycheck in 10 months to start saving money for that. Um, and then I looked at the dates and I looked at the money and I said, there's not going to be enough money. <laughs> When the dates are here, I need to do something. So I sat down and I figured out um, how important it was for that institution to continue, how much we could do for folks in that institution, how much it would help me, my family, but also their families and everybody else. And I wrote an impassioned email to our students. And I said, hey, guys, here's your opportunity to really help the future of JMEC. 
here's the story. Here's how it's going to help you and help and help us. Would you consider paying, you know, a year's dues, three years dues, five years dues instead of a month? Wow. And um, that was a $57,000 email. In three days, I had commitments for $57,000. Not big money in, you know, comparison to other things, but that turned the tide for us. I got the money I needed to make that move. And holy crap. Like, so twice in my life, right? These were both, well, the first one was inspiration, right? Inspiration and desperation. Right. The first one was inspiration. I was like, I'm inspired. I'd like you to be along for the ride. And the guy said, hell yes. And then the next one was desperation. Holy crap. If we don't come up with this money, I don't know what's going to happen to JMAC. And in both cases, it was a wild success. And it just means if you reach down deep enough and you think uh, uh, carefully about the process, put the time in and then come across with passion, uh, uh, some great things can happen. And in both cases, you got the reinforcement that, yes, you are on the right track. You are doing something of value. That is, that is a, that's a couple of tremendous moments. I love the pairing of inspiration and desperation. I've had the lesson. You know, I heard people say that. And now I've lived it. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. What's the, and, maybe, and maybe that was it, but what, what would you say is the biggest risk you've ever had to take? Um, I don't know if that was the risk. I think the risk was before that, you know, when I did leave Traverse City and moved to Ann Arbor with essentially zero dollars and just the promise of a future dojo. I think that was a, that was a big risk. Um, I had a great partner. My wife was willing to make that move um, and go from a comfortable living in a beautiful place to who knows what. Um, so having somebody like that in my corner was really helpful. Um, now I've been at it enough and I've taken enough risks where um, risk ain't risk anymore. <laughs> if you see the future and it's something you need to do, it's just what we said about failure, right? Risk ain't risk anymore. I know how to live on no money. And if I have a big enough goal, I'm willing to do that again, right? Now, I've been poor and I've been pretty well off. I prefer well off. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot more opportunity, a little more security. You can do more things for more people. But if I have to be poor in the pursuit of a dream again, I'll do it in a heartbeat. That's a great vision. I, I One of the things that I believe I heard it from the Tim, from Tim Ferriss's podcast is he suggests that you do this thought exercise where you ask yourself literally what's the worst that can happen and mm -hmm. even choose to mentally put yourself in that environment and recognize that the worst that can happen from most risks that we're going to take is not actually that bad compared to the amazing upside of the dream. That's exactly right. And that's where that fear leverage comes in, man. You can't let fear stop you. You do it. You deal with the fear and you fall down and then you get up and uh getting up man every time you get up right that with that which does not kill you makes you stronger <laughs> looking back what what is a lesson or what is something that you wish you'd known when you started and we we all probably a thousand things but but what is something that jumps out that you said man if i'd known this at the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey it would have made a monstrous difference in my world uh, it's a lesson I keep learning in about every decade. I have to reset my sights. Uh, uh, look up. I don't set my goals big enough. I need more big, audacious, scary goals. And when I set my goals, I tend to reach them at some point, not always as quickly as I'd like to. Um, I'm at that stage right now. This uh, the 2019 is a, is a reset year. Um, and I'm leveling up. So if I wish I had known, right, don't be afraid. <laughs> Set your goals as big as you can dream. And when they seem stupid and, and people are going to laugh at you, they're, you're getting close. Right. It, it does. That leads naturally to a, another question, which is, what do your dreams look like going forward? What do you, what do you envision the next 10, 20 years of, of, your, of your growing dream? What does it look like? Uh, well, in the, in, the, in the companies that, I, that I'm doing the most work in, so Japanese Martial Arts Center, Michigan SEO group, my uh, marketing company, and in permission, we're getting a lot of work done in the room. I call those the laboratory. We're doing great things for great people, great clients. I've got great teams on board. We're dialed in pretty well. We're delivering great products and services. Um, the next three years is all about leveraging that online, is offering that to people who maybe can't come to the JMAC to train, who can't afford the ticket to pay Michigan SEO group to do professional marketing for them who can't come to their permission event and dedicate 12 hours in Ann Arbor or wherever we held it for whatever reason, you know, let's say they're in the Philippines and we're here, they can't make it until I can get to the Philippines. What can they do? Right? So I want to leverage those tools online. That's the next three years. 
um, that's where the businesses are going. Um, I am in love with uh, the American West, and um, in the next within the next seven to ten years, I really want to buy some property near Jackson, Wyoming. Now, you may know um, in in the United States, right? There's two enclaves of the rich and famous. There's the um, Hollywood enclave of Aspen, and then there's the conservative uh, and political enclave of Jackson. Now, I don't care about that, but the landscape there is the most beautiful and inspirational landscape I've ever seen. And so my, my uh, unrealistic, insane, uh, stupid, way too big goal is to, to buy some property in the, in the greater Jackson Hole Valley uh, where I can go every year and just groove on the landscape. So that's, that's the reward for all the hard work. That's amazing. And maybe that it becomes the future home of permission. Who knows? That'd be a great place to hold some of those events. Yep. So as you look forward and you think about those, those dreams, does it still feel scary? Or as you said before, does it, does it, is risk not risk anymore? So it doesn't feel as scary. Yeah. Um, it, it, the first reaction is still the fear reaction. You know, when I think about something, especially when it is one of those goals that everybody else in the world thinks is stupid, the first reaction is this nervous, reflexive, oh my gosh, that's scary. The second reaction is, wait a minute, that's composed of small steps. And if the small steps can be completed in a consistent manner, in a rational way, moving forward at all times, then I can do this. Will there be some risk? Yes. Um, is it worth it? Absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's only that first microsecond. After that, the, the, the fear is manageable. I think it's it's good for our audience to hear that even someone as experienced and successful as yourself still feels that moment of fear that it's it's that you though have shredded it to where it's a microsecond to where it's a thin barrier to step through whereas for others they may feel like it's a it's a cement wall or maybe a mountain that they're trying to go through the reality is that in either case it's one step away yeah and you know i mean it, steve jobs you know used to say don't be afraid Right. Somebody, uh, one of the companies early on he was working with, they wanted this incredible glass screen for one of the devices they were making. And he was having a meeting with them and their executives said, listen, we're afraid we're not going to be able to deliver on the quality of glass that you need. And Steve said to them, don't be afraid. Right. And what he meant was jump in, solve the problem. Right. All right. I say, turn your eyes outward and upward, not inward and downward. Life right? Spe living a spectacular life is a spectrum, right? Your struggles aren't the same as mine. They shouldn't be. On a side note, that's why it's so important not to judge others by our own standards. But life's a lot more fun when you have a clear mission and energy to go after it. When you focus on everything happening after that first step, right? That's exciting. You don't have to, if you stop at the first step, you're turning your eyes inward and downward. You're going, this is the thing in my way. I'm not capable of passing by. If you can make the mental switch to thinking about, okay, here's everything that comes afterwards. Yeah, there's some hard work, but it's fun. It's a process. Here's the ultimate goal, right? What are all these things going to mean for me, for my family, for my community and the world? Uh, then the, the, the fear, as, as you said, becomes a microsecond. It doesn't happen overnight. Some people spend weeks struggling. We had a story about that permission, right? It was a young lady at permission who was trying to move she couldn't get the courage to move. In fact, she drove 900 miles and then drove back because she was too afraid to finalize that, but she's finally made the move. Her struggle is much bigger than mine, but I'm farther down the path as, as it should be, right? I've had those struggles. I've worked on them. And as I've done it, I've gotten a little bit better and a little bit better. So I'm not superhuman. If I can do it, anybody can do it. It's just a process of, of uh, repetitive work and it works a lot better when you have great people in your corner, mentors, support partners, groups, people like you, right? It's resources like Dreams Are Real, resources like Permission, uh, uh, folks like you and I who are putting together groups that are not just uh, to build businesses up, but also to support people as they go. That makes that process a lot easier. Speaking of resources, are there any particular resources that have made it easier for you to chase your dreams, whether it be books or whatever people or, or, or programs or anything that have been particularly impactful for you? You mentioned your, your mentor earlier in the, in the martial arts. I'm sure there've been, there've been others. 
Are there any yeah. that may be helpful to our audience? Well, that was the guy, the people that people could, the, the folks that people can easily grab a hold of. Um, the first big personal development guy in my life was Tony Robbins. Um, you know, I read everything he had written. I went to one of his events. Um, I've since followed uh, Brendan Burchard, Deepak Chopra, um, um, Zig Ziglar, uh, Jim Rohn. You know, you take, like, like uh, Bruce Lee said, right? You absorb what is useful. You take from each what they have to offer. You know, all those guys are selling something, and sometimes that can get in the way of the message. That doesn't mean they don't have any value. So if you can sort through and find the things that work for you, um, I'm an avid consumer. You're, even after 30 years after attending my first Tony Robbins event, I still read everything I can get my hands on by those guys. I'm now in a Dan Pena phase of my life. He's not everybody's cup of tea. He's profane. He's insulting. But he's the, you know, he's the $50 billion man. He builds people into these incredible entrepreneurs. And if you can sort through that, take, a, take away the parts you don't like, take the lessons that you do, um, I think it's more important to take a shower every day than to take one once and quit. And what I mean by that, I think it's more important to keep reading and studying and finding folks. Um, so I don't say there's one person out there. I say that it's the habit that matters. Read something every day. Watch some positive videos every day. And when those people that you like make reference to somebody else, go look them up and follow them too. Consistency trumps intensity every time. In that world, it absolutely does. Right. That's, that's a beautiful thing. If you think about these newer entrepreneurs thinking, man, well, this is, what do I need to be? What's the most important characteristic you think that an entrepreneur needs to have if they're going to be successful? Uh, I guess I'd call it grit. It's kind of like what you just said. Consistency trumps intensity in entrepreneurship. Not to say you don't need intensity. Um, it's just grit. It's just getting in there, doing the work. Um, uh, Jocko Willick, right? Navy SEAL, started mm -hmm. something called Echelon Front. Um, he says something I love. He says, even when I'm just going through the motions, I go through the motions. Maybe today you're not feeling it, right? You go to a seminar, you get all hyped up, you're inspired. You're like, oh my God, I got this great plan. This is great. A week later, you're like, this is hard work. <laughs> yeah, just do the work. Sometimes, right? You sit down to do the work and you're dragging. And then next thing you know, right? You got good music on, you're getting work done. And an hour later, you go, wow, that was pretty cool. I just got a ton of work done. I felt like crap when I started, but I feel great now. Uh, so it's grit. It's the, it's the willingness to get in there every day and do the things you know you need to do. And then to resource what you need to try and bring the joy at the same time. Grit, resilience, all of those things blending together into, into one spot. You've done so many things and accomplished a lot of different, really a, a variety of different goals, not just in succession, but in parallel in many cases. How do you feel when others cite you as an example that dreams are real? Uh, I love that. I also say, um, uh, are you willing to do what I've done? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, a lot of people talk about life balance now. Well, I don't really believe in life balance. I mean, I love my wife and I love my kid more than the earth itself. I spend time with them. But um, my day rises and falls with my work. I love what I do. And you got to make sacrifices. So I love when people say, oh, my God, Nick, you're doing great. How do you do all these businesses? That's amazing. And I say, I love what I do. I work at it constantly. Are you binging Netflix? Are you addicted to a TV series? Are you, um, you know, are you, uh, you know, let's say I believe in long walks in the woods, but are you doing it every day of the week? Like, um, uh, you better do some work, man. If you want to be like me, you better... <laughs> You better, be willing to, you better be willing to make some sacrifices and do some hard work. Uh, uh, so, yes, I, I love it. Um, but I don't think I'm such – I don't think I'm – I've been blessed with a lot of energy. Um, and that's probably the key. It makes it maybe a little easier for me. But, um, you know, people say the same thing about me about being in shape. I'm like, well, you know, stop. Like, start a business that requires you to go in and work out five days a week, right? <laughs> and then come talk to me about being in shape. I mean, I'm glad and I'm proud of it, but it's not because I'm a superhuman. It's because I do the stuff. I, when I, even when I'm just going through, through the motions, I go through the motions, you know? That's great. As we, as we wrap up 
today, we want to move into our fortunate five. And these are, these are five fun questions that we ask everybody at the end that look back at the past, look a little bit toward the future of thinking of just some fortunate things that we either have or may experience. The first question is, what is the most exciting or adventurous thing that you've ever done? Well, the list is long, but probably the biggest one was um, after grad school with 3000 bucks in my pocket, I moved to Tokyo with uh, no job. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just wanted to train in martial arts. So that was, that was probably the. the did you already thing. speak the language when you went? I did study Japanese for a year and a half while I was in college. However, I made a couple friends early on when I was over there. And one night at dinner, the guy looks at me and he goes, you know, when you speak Japanese, I can't understand a word you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I had some, uh, some work to do, but it was a big adventure. I mean, it was a completely foreign world. I had only seen it on TV and read about it in books. So moved over there, made a couple of connections and, uh, and never looked back. That, that's a great risk and jump to have taken and certainly very adventurous. What is something even now, you have so many skills, what is something now that you wish you were good at but aren't yet? I wish I was better at being patient. <laughs> the, the, the downside of having a lot of energy is that I want everything done yesterday and the internet hasn't helped. You know, you, you have, you've probably had this experience. You know, in the old days, you'd send a letter. And if you got another one back at three months, you're doing great. I send an email now and in 20 minutes, I'm checking. Where's my response? <laughs> right. right. And it's true about building businesses. And most importantly, in my world, I am trying to become more patient with people, the people I work with because I unfortunately still have unreasonable expectations of others and it's not fair because they have their own struggles. But um, so yeah, I wish I was more patient. I resonate completely with that. One of the conversations I've had with some of my leadership teams has been that it's, it's easy for us to place the expectations that other people would do exactly what we do but if they were doing exactly what we would do, they'd be at a different point in their journey and they'd already be there. <laughs> so right? Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to change that filter. What is the best meal or food experience that you've ever had? Well, once again, I've been in life. I've, I've had many. One recent one was actually in Tokyo. We went, I went back with some folks to train in March of this year. And um, there's a famous there's a famous sushi shop called Jiro Sushi. There was a movie about it. And my friends wanted to go to that. We made some inquiries and all the locals said, whatever you do, don't go there. The guy's famous now. You're not going to like it. It's, it's, a, it's a canned experience. It's not authentic. It's not what it used to be. Huh. But, they said, but there is this sushi shop that nobody knows about. And it's over here in this industrial area. You'll never find it on your own. If we call up and make a reservation ahead of time, you would go in there. And it was, it was mind blowing. You know, I've been kicking around the world of sushi long enough to kind of know what's good and what's not. And if you can imagine a curated, you know, three hour experience uh, with this guy who is already knows kind of what your likes and dislikes are, and also has this artistic notion of like how something should be served, what's served next, what's with it, what do you drink? What he says to you, I mean, it was this choreographed three-hour experience uh, uh, that nobody will never replicate, and nobody will ever find this place because it literally is in this warehouse district in Tokyo. Um, and then the, the, the culmination of that meal was at the end, one of the guys that went with me said, hey, this guy's really into knives. And the guy didn't speak Japanese, and I do. And he said, would you ask the guy what his favorite knife is? So I did, and that led to a 30-minute demonstration and conversation where this guy brought out his old knives that were too worn out to use and his new ones and demonstrated how they should be used and the history and what he loved about them. I mean, it was it, – it, so, yeah. That was that amazing. Was, that was, a, that was a, a meal of a lifetime for many reasons, the food just being one of them. You'll have to go back. I would love to. <laughs> I'm trying to go back next year. <laughs> that that – uh... That is just a fantastic experience and you're wonderful at getting us in the moment. I, I, I'm not even a sushi guy and I'm, and I'm hungry for sushi now. It's pretty, uh, pretty insane. What, you've traveled all over the world. What is your dream travel destination? What's somewhere that you haven't been that you look and say, I really want to go there still? 
Uh, there's several. I still want to go to South America. Uh, I've never even been to Mexico, so I haven't been to the southern part of this hemisphere. And um, before I met my wife and fell in love with her, I had a trip planned to Cuba. That was back when it was still illegal to go. I don't know if it is again. I can't keep track of it. But um, And then I, I met this wonderful woman, fell in love with her, and canceled that trip. But I still want to go to Latin America and South America um, because of the food, the culture, the people. So, yeah, that's, that's on the list. It's on my list as well. I have been to a little bit of Mexico, but more touristy. I've not gone further south, and I have several friends and people that I know around the world that spend a lot of time down there every year. So I, I, I have to go and have a wonderful experience there as well. Different twist. What do you hope or believe will be the most exciting invention of the next 30 years? Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I glanced at that question, you know, before the interview, but when you ask it to me, it's like, man, that's here, here's what I think. As I've mentioned it at permission, and you were there not too long ago, I spent a lot of time following the science around health, around personal psychology, around motivation. Um, and what I've noticed is that a lot of breakthroughs are coming in multimodal ways now, is that, is that they're making big strides with Alzheimer's, not with like a medicine, but with a treatment that involves exercise, socialization, medicine, right? Um, health is the same way, right? Exercise, nutrition attitude, socialization. Um, I think, and it won't take 30 years, I think it's going to take five years for them to, to, for science to start putting together consortiums of experts that can address certain specific topics like longevity, like Alzheimer's, uh, uh, like sports performance in a multimodal way. And I think the, uh, the, the amount of juice that we get out of life and the amount of time we get out of life is going to be dramatically altered. And I don't think it's going to take 30 years. That will make a tremendous difference for all of civilization. I hope so. I, I, I love that vision with it. You've mentioned permission a few times, and I, I enjoyed greatly being at the event. Take just a moment, if you would, and share a little bit about what permission is and maybe a little bit of the broader vision for it of how it impacts people's lives. Because I think it's important for people, whether they've been to one of these events or even could go to one soon, or whether they may not see something from it for some time to grab the concept and understand the importance of it. So permission is a 12 hour immersive event where we help you dial in your dreams and goals, figure out what your outside stuff is, which is to say the things that stand in your way and the resources you have, figure out what your inside stuff is. You and I have already talked about that a little bit. That is the voices in your head or the habits that you have that keep you from thriving. Um, and we put together a master plan for how to address those things and how to uh, uh, take a few action steps to get you moving. So you leave with inspiration and a powerful master plan to move yourself dramatically forward towards your vision for what life can be. The second question I always get is, why does it have to be 12 hours? Well, it has to be 12 hours because to break through your resistance to really understanding your inside stuff and to be able to share that with others, it takes some time. That's where the science comes in. That's where I have breathing, postural stuff, meditation, the right questions, the right exercise to get people in the right frame of mind to share their inside stuff. Um, but, um, you know, you're in the, in the permission group, Dan, you've seen that there, are, you know, a third of the people that come say, this was life changing in some way. We've had people change their careers after permission. We've had people do in six months what they plan to do in three years after permission. Uh, it's, it's, and I don't take credit for it alone. I'm just, I, there's no new ideas there. It's just me hosting an event that's curated in a way to create a great experience for people. Um, so the long-term vision is to serve a lot more people in a lot larger arenas and to be able to provide online education for people that can't make it. I think it's a tremendous vision. I enjoyed greatly being there. It's a powerful event for those in the area. The next one that comes up, you should certainly go. And the broader message that we need to give ourselves permission to move forward in our lives and that we can do that by making connections, being honest, making a clear plan, getting past the barriers that we face is so important for everyone. I love the mission that you are spreading in the world with that. As, you, as we wrap up, is there a certain thought or a message that you'd like to leave with our audience? 
Um, yeah, you know, it's, I think, the theme that we've bounced against a number of times so far today, right? Uh, many people see the mountain, but very few people do what it takes to climb to the top. Um, and as our buddy Don Pryor said, right, if you want joy when you get to the top, you got to bring that with you. It's just as hard, I said this already, it's just as hard to lead, lead a life of mediocrity as it is to leave a li lead a life of excellence. But it's just that in mediocrity, the pain comes later, and it's too late to do anything about it. The world actually does want you to succeed. You just have to learn to listen to the right voices. So uh, you can do it. You, me, your listeners, you really can. Everything that says you can't is just an excuse. So my path has been body first, mind second, work third, build a routine for vibrant health and robust curiosity, find a path you love, and then work at it like your life dependent on it. I uh, said this, uh, uh, you know, in the first five minutes of permission, set your expectations unreasonably high and then work your ass off to fulfill them. <laughs> and you have been able to fulfill them consistently. Where can people find you online? What, uh, what, what are you working on that they need to know about and how can they connect with you? Come see a bunch of stuff I've got at uh, nicholasswino.com. That's N-I-C-K hyphen. No, no, let me start again. N-I-C-K-L-A-U-S hyphen. Suino, S-U-I-N-O dot com. And um, you can find uh, uh, access to purchase my books there. You can read a bunch of uh, great articles on things like getting more confidence or overcoming obstacles. You can see some videos. And just generally speaking, there's that. Or you can go on Facebook and find the permission group. Either way, um, you know, you'll find a lot of information about what we do. And I'm always happy to answer questions if people reach out. If you are not following this guy, you need to be. Do it today. We'll put the links in the show notes so that you can just click through and it'll only take you a few seconds. But this is a man of inspiration, a man of success, and a man of a great leadership example. Thanks for joining us, Nick. I greatly appreciate it. Dan, I love being here and I can't wait to see what you do with all this stuff in the future. All right. Perfect. Thank you, man. Thank you for joining us on the Dreams Are Real podcast. If anything we've said has inspired you to dream bigger, live more boldly, or move closer to your ideal life, please reach out and let us know. And also be sure to share this episode with a friend. We would be honored if you would like, subscribe, or leave a review for our show on your favorite podcasting platform. And for more discussion of this episode and all things related to the Dreams Are Real podcast, and to receive your free download of Dan's Defining Your North Star training, please join our Dreams Are Real community on Facebook. Until next time, be amazing and keep crushing it.